thank you all again for joining us for another segment of My STEM Journey. We have another amazing panel of women in STEM here to speak with you all. And I don't want to take up too much time, of course. This is something that we are doing as part of uh, Balance Brilliance Professional Development Series. And we're always happy to bring the voices of women in STEM to you. We're going to begin with, in my own words, that segment where our um, participants and panelists tell us a little bit about where they are currently in STEM. And then, of course, we're going to dive a little bit back into the past and talk about the entire journey that got them here. So we will, again, I'll start off with introducing our panel. We have Dr. Catherine Chang, Dr. Sharnice Moore, and Dr. Laura Rivard. Tell us about where you are currently in your position. I'm Kat, and um, I'm currently an Associate Director in Academic Collaborations at a company called Exact. And Exact is a company that's focused on early detection of cancer. And so what I do is I bring ideas from the research academic institutions to our company to be productized or commercialized. Uh, my name is Sharni Moore. I currently serve as the Southwest Division Director for Corporate Responsibility with Dignity Health, which was recently rebranded as Common Spirit Health through a merger. You know, that corporate responsibility is just another way to say compliance. Um, so I'm a hospital compliance officer. I help facilities throughout Arizona and Nevada to make sure that they're meeting federal regulations and guidance. And that can be from anything from Medicare regulations with billing to OIG, uh, Office of Inspector General, uh, audits and findings and stances to anything related to clinical trials and research. Um, so it really covers a uh, wide breadth and scope. And it, it's, it's really challenging, but also really rewarding work. I'm Laura Rivard. I currently work at the University of San Diego, where I'm a teaching professor and outreach coordinator for the sciences. So the teaching professor part is pretty self-explanatory. I teach. <laughs> I teach two classes a semester. The outreach coordinator part um, is really two different aspects. The first is I help students um, organize internships at different companies and research institutes in San Diego. So Kat, <laughs> maybe I'll be reaching out to you after this. Um, and the other part is community engagement. So I take USD students out into the greater San Diego community and we bring um, hands-on brains on science activities, mostly to our K through 12 community partners. And, and that's just a real highlight of my work. Thank you all for sharing where you are currently. And we're gonna delve into next of how you got there. I know there's many steps along the way. I'm sure you're gonna give us all the insights of that. Um, and I'm just happy to have this conversation with you all. Um, one of the first questions that I had, and I decided to definitely keep for every one of these conversations is people really wanna know what was the foundation for you? You know, in a way they're saying, a lot of what we do at Balanced Brunch is around trying to mitigate these gender norms about, you know, intelligence and brilliance and, and, and how they relate to, you know, how girls perform in the academic setting or perform in STEM. So a lot of people are wondering, one of the questions I've seen again and again in a different way is about upbringing in that, do you recall in your home environment or, this, or your social environment, whether or not there was any expectations laid on you that wasn't laid on boys? or any expectations for achievement that you realize that, you know, around your capabilities that may have been, you know, presented to you or maybe not presented to you where the boys were expected to do these things because they were capable, but you were not expected. I um, hope that question's clear enough, but it's really just a question related to upbringing and foundation. I have a lot to say on that. <laughs> <laughs> a, a good place to start would be is that my father is from the very deep South in Mississippi. And my mom is from Jamaica and came to the US uh, as almost an adult, almost when she was 20 years of age. Um, so that's very different cultural backgrounds right there, very different um, expectations, norms and expectations. Um, I can say that I, ha I have an older brother, six years older, and I have a sister that's six years younger. So I'm right there in the middle. Growing up in my family, education was always pushed, especially from my mother coming from uh, another country and didn't have as many opportunities as she saw in the US. She definitely encouraged all of us to take advantage of that. Um, but one of the takeaways that I have from my childhood, and I've often had this conversation with my mother as an adult now, is that that push seemed to me to be a little bit harder on the girls than it did the boys. 
So it was, you know, your brother, Charles, he can find a job. He'll get a job. He can use his hands. He can do whatever. You're going to need something to fall back on. You're going to need education. You don't want to make, you want to make sure that you're not relying on anyone else for your livelihood. And I very much appreciated those messages and, uh, you know, th that kind of push. But at the same time, it wasn't the same message that was being delivered to my brother. Um, so that's one piece. Another piece of my upbringing is that both of my parents served in the military. So my family did quite a bit of moving. Um, I've lived in places like Hawaii and Guam, Detroit, Mississippi, Rhode Island, Arkansas, Kentucky. I'm in Arizona now. Um, but having some of those different cultural experiences in terms of places that I lived, but then also my mother's side of the family being from another country, I got to see how different types of people um, pursue education and the value that they place on education. And so coming from places like Hawaii and Guam, where just seeing the education was so important and that it was almost just expected that, you know, you're going to go to college. I never had a thought that I wasn't going to go because that's what the conversation was for so long. Um, and then at a fairly young age, leaving that type of environment and moving to Mississippi, where it was a much different cultural approach to education, where it wasn't as valued. Um, it was kind of selective for whoever had money, um, whoever was perceived to have money for someone who was really, really smart at the top of their class. Um, but I had a lot of high school uh, classmates who did not go on to pers uh, pursue education just because that wasn't something that was valued um, in those families. So that's kind of a lot to grapple with. Um, and even going back as an adult, this will be the last thing I say and then I'll stop. Even going back home as an adult and seeing some of my friends that I've graduated high school with from Mississippi, um, I, you know, I've, I've even had people say, well, why didn't you or your family talk to more people to help them understand the value in this or what can happen now, what can take place now? So it, it, it's really important to understand and value those things early on. Um, so that way you can kind of map out what you want to do with your life. You have me thinking about when you were talking about the messaging that you receive and your brother received being different. Because one of the things I think your mother was addressing is this, this conversation around the feminization of poverty. And a lot of times that's related to, you know, what type of jobs women are usually um, pursue or kind of locked into in some ways. And we talk about that a bit a lot at Bonnet's Brilliance and has me rethinking, are we doing it in a helpful enough way? Are we just telling girls, are we scaring girls? Like, you know, like you said, the boys can do things and they'll get a job because of their hands. So it has me rethinking what that messaging should look like. Because yes, we need to address that, but it should also not be in such a way that boys are capable in ways that you are not. So therefore this is their only route for you. We still, so, yeah, I, I thank you for that insight because it has me really thinking about how do we go back to that messaging about all these things available in STEM and, you know, the social mobility tied to it without it sounding like we're trying to scare them. A kind of scare tactic because you are lacking in this physical way that a boy may have a, a, a vantage over you. So I thank you for bringing that perspective because it's one to rethink for us as well in our messaging. I grew up in, in upper middle class um, city in, in Northern California. So I was definitely surrounded by um, other folks and other families who were going to college. Both my parents went to college. So again, sort of like Sharnice was describing, there was never a moment where it was a question about whether or not I would. And my, my dad's a chemical engineer. And so when I was tiny and I love my, my dad is my hero. So when I was little, I'd be like three running around going, I'm going to be an engineer. <laughs> I didn't really know what that meant, but you know, they, they thought it was great. And um, as I got older though, I realized I was more drawn to the life sciences. I had, you know, the, the posters all over every, I'd get this world magazine and every month they'd have a, a pullout poster of a different animal. And my room was covered with the animals. So I, I crystallized around this idea of wanting to be a biology teacher, um, you know, probably by the time I was in middle or high school, I just really loved life sciences and I really loved teaching. And I, and I, I thought, you know, that's, that's what I want to do. And it wasn't until later in life that I reflected, my parents were like, that's great. And, and when I would talk to them about it and I'd say, and part of the reason I want to do that is because I think it'll be a good job for when I have a family and they never 
and they might today, they, but they never pushed back. Well, maybe your husband will be the one that stays home with the kids, or maybe you'll get childcare and be able to do what you want. But they were, um, they thought it sounded perfectly reason, reasonable that I would be considering that while I was um, making my future plans. And I, you know, again, everybody has different tracks and, and I, I family is a huge part of what I do today. And I'll, and we'll probably talk more about that, um, in another segment. Of course, that wasn't anything that they ever said to my brother or acknowledged about, well, maybe you want to have a job too, where you can be home with your kids part of the time or be flexible if your wife also wants to work. So you can, um, you can share those parenting duties. It was pretty implicit that the woman is the primary caregiver of children. And so it was just wise to be considering that while you were planning your career, even as far back as middle and high school, before you actually had any, had any children. We had a fundraiser over the weekend. And on Saturday, I met somebody who was buying one of our workbooks uh, for her granddaughter, who was going to be an engineer. I just started thinking about how you're like, I'm going to be an engineer. Like my dad, I was like, your granddaughter is going to be an engineer. Did she tell you this already? And then when I met her granddaughter, her granddaughter was actually um, not yet born. Her, she, <laughs> her daughter-in-law came over to point out that her granddaughter's name is going to be Sophia and she'll be here with us in three months. But again, they were planning early on that this girl is going to be an engineer. <laughs> so that just had me just thinking about that, um, putting that together about your early planning and stages. And that's, again, for um, our audience, for our, those who are doing internships and with us balanced brains in the high schoolers, it's never too early to think about that career and the family you want uh, as part of your career. <laughs> Kat, um, please, we would love to hear your uh, uh, input. <laughs> sure. So I grew up in Hawaii. Um, I experienced something different from Sharnice. Um, I came from very humble beginnings. Um, and so when I was about 10 years old, I remember going to like an awards banquet where, you know, they celebrate, oh, you got straight A's this year. Great. And remember at the end of that banquet, my father said, we're not paying for college. And so at an early age, I knew that I needed to be financially self-sufficient, that I was going to be able to support myself and my family. Um, and so from there, um, I did everything that I could to put myself through college. So I got a full ride at University of Hawaii, and then I did my master's and my PhD. Um, and I really got that influence from my mother. Um, she, she really focused she really emphasized as education being that gateway for opportunities and that I could do whatever I put my mind to. So I was really lucky that my mother supported me. Um, and, and so um, I think some of the messages that I picked up along the way though was really, was really interesting. So in engineering as an undergrad, being like the only female in a male class, that was very, very interesting. And then also, you know, trying to make sure that I perform well um, so that I'm representing myself well. Um, that was also a challenge, but I think um, just having that mindset of putting the work in and you know moving forward and progressing that and having that learning mindset was really helpful. You actually kind of segue into my next question, it's kind of brought up your mother. Can you talk about her role a little bit more that you described yeah. as, your, as a role model? And then the next step would be that those were the role models you had in the home, but, and then also talking about some of your first STEM role models, when you start realizing that I actually like science, who are the people who will help you kind of direct you into that way of saying, this is a possibility for you to pursue this. So I have an older sister and from when we were little, she, my, both of my parents have only a high school education. And so um, as we grew up, she really did emphasize education and in Hawaii, um, you really have to seek out quality education. It's not just there for you. And so she would go into our classes and fight for the best teachers, for us to have the best teachers, which was amazing, you know, at that time. Um, and so I think she really did pave that path for us. But as we got older, I remember being in the sixth grade and like doing my homework and she would try to check it and she'd be like, okay, you're past my level. I can't help you anymore. You're on your own. And then, so having that knowledge of, as I, you know, move on in my career, being able to think of people who can mentor me or at least like help me and people who have been there before, that was something I knew I needed to focus on. I have, um, rather than a role model, I would say I, I had a bit of an anti-role model. <laughs> so oh. I, um, like I said, from when I was pretty little, I, I thought I was interested in, in teaching, but I, I didn't know what, I didn't know if I wanted to do elementary school or, or you know high school and, and have a particular subject. 
And I had, um, I, it was my freshman year in high school. I had a biology teacher that was really bad, really, really bad. And he would, he would teach things wrong. He would be disorganized. He would be confusing. And, um, I, I was that obnoxious student sometimes where I'd be like, I don't think that's right. <laughs> and I would say the book says, you know. <laughs> And I'd, I'd go home at night and I would think, you know, if I was teaching this, I would do it this way. And I would really sit there for, you know, an hour and I would think about what we had learned about in class and, and how I would do it differently and how I would think it would be more, um, more interesting and, and easier to understand. And so having that negative experience really did crystallize for me, though, that this is what I want to do. If I'm of, on my own time thinking about this stuff and how I would do it differently, that probably means that this is something that um, that I meant to do. I love how you call them the anti-rule models because they become <laughs> that example of what I'm not going to be and I, what I don't want to do. So, <laughs> so they're also a benefit to us. <laughs> I will say speak on uh, two people that have motivated me one way or another. Um, and the first came in sixth grade. Uh, I was in Mississippi and one of my close friends got pregnant. And I did not even know that in sixth grade that we could get pregnant, exactly how someone got pregnant. Um, and she had her baby. She had her baby that year and it worked out to when we got to our senior year, her and her child could ride the bus together to school. And I just remember thinking in sixth grade, how can this be possible? So from there, I really felt like, oh, I'm, I'm gonna go and I'm, I'm gonna help uh, young kids and, and young people who may find themselves in this situation and I, started my uh, undergraduate career focused on biology and didn't do as well as I thought I should have in biology. And I was really devastated. And I spoke with an academic advisor that I had and a mentor, he turned out to be a very great mentor. And he spoke to me about social sciences and said, you know, this is really something that you ought to consider. And just from my family background and, and, and household, telling a, a older Jamaican woman that you're not going to go to medical school, that you're gonna go and do something in social sciences. They're like, what is that? What does that even look like? What, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna be? What, what does this amount up to? Um, but that ac academic advisor really encouraged me um, to kind of focus on a different path. And it was one of the best things that could have ever happened to me um, because that's really where I grew to love public health. And that's what set me on that journey. Again, we're still thinking back to these upbringings, that foundational period, um, and trying to connect it a little bit to the present. I wanted to ask this question about what type of discouragement did you experience along the way, whether it was a person, whether it was someone telling you you couldn't get, um, you shouldn't pursue an assignment, a project, a subject, or even your major, um, or if it's somebody who's, who would have to told you something about like a gender microaggression, if you ever experienced any of those. I'm thinking back to this um, article I read where there was these um, women in STEM and they submitted something to an academic journal that on their research and the reply was from one of the researchers who I, I don't know why he actually thought that these things won't go public that they they were lacking a male on their team literally saying that you know the research would have been better received if they had like some kind of male leadership or something guiding their work and that was you know it, it kind of blew up it was about four or five years ago I remember that came out and I was like oh I've been a, a reviewer I would never say that because you know sometimes your reviews are going to be read and you might be you know you don't know whoever's going to read your feedback on that as well so it just had me thinking about how many reviewers are actually just going to stop and look at the subject line and look at the people who submitted that article and they're looking for the man there's no man does that mean that it's going to be a less legitimate paper to consider um so those are the type of things I'm, i want to see if you came across anything like that any discouragement based on your gender or challenges that you think were gender related I have a couple um, stories related to that. When, um, like I said, I start, I, I knew for a long time that I wanted to teach. I went to an undergraduate, I went to UCLA and I was a biology major, but I was still intending to be a, a high school teacher. And then I got about 
halfway, two thirds of the way through the, the curriculum. And I just realized I really love biology and I wasn't done learning. I didn't, I, cause if you teach high school, you know, you're, you, you'll get your undergraduate degree and, and that's pretty much it. And the most you'll likely teach is that first year of bio that you have in at undergrad your um, in college. So I thought I want to keep going. So I decided to, to go get my PhD and I did. And then I, I got about, you know, halfway through that. And you, it's certainly 20 years ago when I was doing my PhD, the, um, the thought was you would stay in research, whether it be a research institution and, and you it might teach a little bit, but you would your primary job would be doing research or even a company. Even that was not super people. They weren't really fired up about that. It really wanted you to stay in academic research. And I realized about two thirds of the way through that I still really wanted to teach. You know, I, I enjoyed research, but it was not it didn't light my fire the way that that teaching did. And uh, I said something to my advisor at some point, and he said to me, you're going to take your PhD from the Salk Institute and just teach. Wow. <laughs> and I, I don't think that, I don't think he would have said that to a man first. <laughs> um, but that was, um, yeah, that was unfortunate. I don't think he meant it quite the way that it, that it came out, but it was, um, but at that point, I was confident enough in my decision that, yeah, I am going to, and and, and it's going to be great. And it has been. Um, and the, the other thing that happened um, was when I was at my, in my current role, and there's a terrible website <laughs> that I'm sure some of your viewers have been on called ratemyprofessor.com. And some time ago, they had chili peppers where the students would rate the hotness of their professor. And I had a chili pepper and I had several colleagues make comments to me about the chili pepper. And that must be why students were always signing up for my classes. And obviously that's horribly offensive in a, and they were joking, but you know, it certainly felt like a bit of a, of a microaggression. It couldn't possibly be that maybe I'm just a really good teacher. And that's why people are signing up for my classes. It has to be the chili pepper on, on rate my professor, but they've taken them down now. So that, <laughs> so that's no longer an issue. Thank you for those two very, they're, they're different, but so, so similar again, because the things you had to think about were men probably wouldn't have to worry about, okay, the chili pepper, does that mean that they undermine my ability as a professor, you know, being considered an attractive man compared to attractive woman means that attractive woman got there because of her looks bottom line, right? In some way. So that's something that men may not have to worry about in the same way where for you, you're just like, get that off of my profile, you know, just rate my teaching and let my, my, uh, my uh, expertise be the only thing that we consider here um, in that way. So thank you for that. Um, Kat and Sharni, so you want to share anything you may have come across? What, what's very prevalent and common today um, is that hospital leadership, executive leadership, um, seems to be very male dominated. And trying to advance in your career and have kind of some opportunities and doors open and even looking for mentorship um, can be challenging because everybody at the table doesn't look like you. Sometimes it's the, it's the good old boys club. Sometimes it's just, you know, it, it can be difficult to have that banter when it's a group of guys together and they're talking about football and they all know each other from five, 10 years ago. Um, so there have definitely been opportunities that I feel like uh, were not available or accessible to me because of my gender. I always noticed that about hospital leadership as well. And I found it interesting because a lot of times when you look at hospitals, the largest part of their staff is usually female. Um, but they haven't broken that, that glass ceiling to actually enter the leadership positions in so many ways. I mean, even CNO or chief of nursing you know, positions are still almost male when you look at the nursing workforce, but you're like, this has to be at least 60 to 70% women. So you're right. Those are the different challenges that we, you know, at Balance Run is hope to help impact and change. You're, again, putting women in not only the STEM workforce, but leadership positions in the STEM workforce. Mm -hmm. um, it definitely will be a change of dynamics. A lot of times, the higher you get, the, the whiter and more male it, it tends to be. And so you, you start realizing how you're different, right? And, and for a long time, I thought, okay, this differentness plays against me, right? Because I have to work harder, fight harder. But then I started in my mid 30s, started thinking this, how you're unique, it brings value, right? And starting to realize that and understanding the different perspectives you bring really helps. And 
I think a lot of what I experienced in industry was cultural differences. And so being an Asian female, um, learning different skills like self-advocacy, self-advocacy would not exist in Asian culture, especially for females, because um, in the US it's like squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? But in Asian culture, it's like the loudest duck gets shot or the nail that sticks out gets hammered. And so it's very much of a different mindset. And once I was able to shift and think, okay, it's not necessarily, yes, it may feel uncomfortable or different for me, but it is part of a skill set, right? Because part of how you succeed in your job, some of it is performance, some of it is image, and a lot of it is exposure. And so self-advocacy is a skill in itself, but it was really difficult for me to embrace that, having coming from the background that I, I did. You're right. It's all these different things that are happening. It's intersectional, right? The gender, the racial, the cultural, other things that we have to consider. So great, great point on bringing that up. And there's another word that we've been using a bit, and it's one of the questions, so I definitely want to make sure I'm getting to it. It's this thing called mentorship. Um, I think when we first started doing this panel, we had one of the panelists um, admit that she didn't seek out mentors, and she felt like that derailed her career in so many ways. And while she was happy with what she was doing, she realized the lack of mentorship that she couldn't get again because she came from first gener being a first generation college student. She couldn't find that in her community or her family. So I was wondering if you guys can share whether you've sought out mentors and if you haven't, why not? And if you have, can you provide tips on how to actually seek out good mentors and build an actual relationship with mentors? Because I a lot of times people think you're going to see a mentor one time and and that's usually not how it works. You want an actual relationship. So yeah, whoever wants to go first to, to tell us no. If you don't, if you never had a mentor, that's fine. And you can tell us how, how that happened or how that worked out for you and made that decision. But if you have had mentors, kind of describe how you seek them out and how you how do you continue to keep those relationships thriving for you. I will say one of my first professional mentors uh, was in Arkansas and it very much formed in not a direct way. Um, it, it really started off by, this was a person who was looking to hire me for a position. I was already working in the department and this person sought me out and said, you know, I know that you're really focused on this, but I think you would be great at this because you have this experience, you do this, you do this, you do that. And when she named those things, they were not things that I recognized in myself. And I walked away from that conversation going, hmm, maybe she's right. I guess she is right. I, you know, I do do this. I have had exposure in that. And having someone speak that into you when you don't see it yourself or you're not really taking the time to sit back and reflect and take stock of all the experiences that you've had and all of the ways that you've uh, had an impact in an organization can be so powerful. Um, and that's exactly what it was for me. So I, I did end up uh, working with that person and was um, took on several different roles and opportunities while working with that person. And while that mentorship was a great one, it was one that uh, eventually kind of hit a bump in the road. And I was so, you know, distraught when that happened. But I think the bigger thing for me to understand and realize is that the lessons that are that I learned there are lifelong lessons that can be applied at any time in my future and definitely benefited me in the past. And so mentorship is important, but sometimes it's not, you're not going to have the same mentor for your full career or for your full academic or professional career. Sometimes you kind of hand it off. One relationship will benefit you a certain way and you'll be able to help that person as well. And then you move into a different area or realm. Um, and so it's important to, to, to think about that and acknowledge that. And also remember, it's okay to have more than one mentor. It's okay for you to outgrow your mentor or for your mentor to move on and seek other things. Um, but there are definitely people that'll be along your path to help you and people that you can help while you're on your way as well. I love the point around the multiple mentors and knowing that mentorships do come to an end. Um, and I think that speaks to the fact that they were a benefit, that they allow for some growth. And, you, you know, you can only be the underling for so, so, many, for so much long. If you have, have grown from that experience, then the mentor should be able to help others 
and kind of move on in that way. So thank you for that. To add on to that, um, yeah, having a personal board of directors is really helpful. And as Sharni said, that's going to change as you grow and evolve your career, right? In these days, um, some people can have up to three or four careers in their lifetime, right? So it's a very different world that we live in and it's okay to grow. And I think the best mentorships I've found are those that are organic. Um, maybe in the beginning, it's like a cold call or reaching out, but when you have something in common, whether it be a background or an interest, those are the ones that you tend to benefit from each other the most. Um, so I think seek organic connections if you can, um, because those will be likely uh, mutually beneficial. And then don't be afraid to ask. Um, and Think of you know, what's specific or unique about that person if you want to connect with them, because usually that's what will drive them to connect with you too. And I think over the years, I've had different types of mentoring or coaching experiences and having both a coach as well as a peer group has really helped me. Um, and so oftentimes a coach can lead you to a specific goal or a milestone that you wanna reach. Whereas peer groups are really to start thinking about how you can do things differently and you know, have that brain share. I love the idea of peer groups. If you can explain a little bit more what are peer groups and how does this one get one started? If, you know, if you're looking around, you're like, I don't have one. Um, what is it like to, to actually start one? Or what things should you be looking for as people to join your peer group? Yeah, so I think it's kind of like finding your tribe, right? Whether you're in college and you're you know, doing the same major or you're in a specific career field. Um, so for example, um, for Association for Women in Science, we have these um, peer groups uh, where they're kind of all around uh, your same career level. And so I joined one that was director level and it was really good because I could learn from different people about you know, self-advocacy, about negotiation. And so it, it was a lot of sharing, um, which is kind of like coaching each other, which is really beneficial. And so I think a lot of professional organizations will have peer groups um, or, you know, colleges and universities usually do. Well, that's a perfect segue. And I'm glad you mentioned that because I, I was struggling a bit to think about who I would name as my mentor because I, I don't I don't feel like I really had one. And I don't know if it, you know, again, I graduated college in, in 1996, maybe it just wasn't as much of a thing as it is today. I feel like there's a lot more intentionality around identifying mentors and, and, and when you're settled in your career, you be the mentor for someone. I don't, maybe it just didn't come to me or, or it wasn't as much of a movement um, back then, but I did, as Kat was just saying, have a really tight network of friends in graduate school. And we came from all over different parts of the country and there were about, there are eight of us and we're still in touch. We still get together once a year. And because it's really, you know, to borrow the word tribe, it really is, you're, you're bonded by this shared experience and you, you literally speak a language that most people don't speak because when you start, when you're getting your PhD in biology, you're doing some crazy stuff that you can't talk to most people about because they don't know what you're saying. <laughs> so it's really, it's really helpful to have that, that peer group and that, that tight group that can, can, um, empathize and understand. And they're right there with you. And even though we've all gone in very different directions, post-graduation, we still have that, that great foundation. So um, if any of you, again, if your audience is, is thinking about grad school, you know, that might be something to think about as you're investigating the different programs, how many students will be in your cohort, because th that could end up being um, a, a big network that you'll rely on, not just during grad school, but, but after as well. So I would say that was probably the the most important we'll call it mentorship but support system I had in graduate school but the other thing that I did with intention was that I was always watching and listening and just asking you know watching people and and what they did in their role and how they talked about it and were they always complaining about you know this is difficult and that's difficult or did they seem like they were really enjoying their their time and and um and I sort of adopted the model, listen to everyone, follow no one, like take everybody's advice and what they have to share, but then chart your own path because everybody is different and what's working for them or not working for them isn't necessarily going to be the same for you. But by taking bits and pieces from as many people as I could, I was able to sort of craft my, my own path. 
Thank you for that. I think I'm going to forever quote you on the listen <laughs> to everyone and follow no one. I think that really speaks to this whole point of my STEM journey, right? Or any journey in life is that it has to be unique, your own trail that you're blazing out there, but it's really taking inputs from everything around you and then deciding I'm going to turn this way because they already told me what's on that side of the hill and it's not interesting. Go this way, right? So I, I really love that. So forever, we're going to be quoting you on this. <laughs> I love that. I uh, want to spend a little bit of time going into where we are currently when it comes to women in STEM and your current careers. Because one thing that we're seeing, and I keep looking at statistics and, you know, seeing what, what inroads we've made, but this gender wage gap per persists, mm -hmm. uh, the gender wage gap persists even for women of color in STEM in so many ways. And I think that goes back to around to this conversation we're having about being able to better advocate for ourselves. So the question is really for someone who's gonna be a young person entering, you know, early career professional, how do they actually do, what does, that, what does advocating for yourself look like? How do I talk from, speak up for myself without coming across as aggressive, as, you know, and all these other things that sometimes gets put, labels that get put on women who are trying to just simply be more assertive. Right. So if you can explain what techniques you use or what things you think would be helpful in understanding. And also, I would like to say, if you can start talking about when is it time to just go? I think a lot of times we stay in jobs and careers that are not working out for us because we're thinking that we have to be in this fight. But when do you know it's time to switch careers or trying to pursue something else rather than staying and advocating and fighting for yourself? Well, I love that question. And it's um, a skill that that I did not develop until much later than I probably should have. So my current role, I'm a, uh, I'm non-tenured. So I'm a non-tenured professor. And for those of you who, who don't know what that means, um, in when you're a professor at a university, tenure track means you, you come in and you, you start as a, an assistant professor, and then you're promoted to associate professor and then on to full professor. And you're guaranteed in employment then for as, as long as you make tenure, you're guaranteed employment for a long time. And, and there's certain salary bumps with, with each um, progressive step. And, and there's a very clear path. You need to publish X number of papers. You need to do, you know, certain at, at USD, at least meet certain teaching goals, perform some service, but it's, it's very, it's very clear. If you're non-tenure track, you don't have that same safety net. I, we get um, either annual contracts or, or every three years, depending on what your role is. The pay is a lot less. Um, but because of where I was in my life, I, you know, finished my PhD at UCSD, started, do, I did my postdoctoral studies at USD. I had my first child while I was doing my postdoctoral studies. And I was in a position where I would, didn't have to be the primary breadwinner. And in fact, my husband had a job that wasn't very flexible. So it was a, a mat, you know, we had to make that decision. Am I going to try to pursue a tenure track position somewhere, unlikely that I was going to be able to get one in San Diego. You, when, when you're looking for a tenure track position in academia, you have to be willing to go wherever there's a job. It's, it's highly competitive. And that just was not going to be what our family was going to do. It, did, it just didn't make sense for us. And so when USD offered me this non-tenure track um, part-time, it's called 5-8, so more than half-time, but three days a week, basically, teaching position, that was a great fit for where I was at that moment in time and ultimately had three kids. And they got older. And then I reached a point where, huh, I, I, saw, I, I was feeling the ceiling. I love my job. I love teaching. It's great. But I also knew that this was going to be what I was doing forever, that there was no, there was no avenues for me to, to climb anymore. And as an achievement oriented person, that started to get really frustrating. And I didn't, here's where the, here's finally circling back to your question, the negotiation piece. Well, I didn't negotiate. <laughs> I, I went to our chair and I said, um, you know, I'm, this is going to be my last year. Um, cause the, I, you know, I, I like my job. It's great, but I need to, I need to be able to spread my wings and, and have some new challenges. Um, and he said, Oh, okay. Um, and then I, I had lunch with somebody cause I thought maybe I was going to get into science writing and do PR or something. And she said, wait a minute, you love your job. And I said, I do. And she said, I don't think you appreciate that that's actually really rare. There's not very many people that can say they love their job. And if you love it, you should try to figure out a way to make it work. I'm like, okay, 
Well, that's, that's good advice. And, and another friend told me about this book to your point, women don't ask it's by um, Linda Babcock. It was 2007. So there may be a newer book out there <laughs> now, but it's all about what you're describing this phenomenon. You know, if you took a man and their studies, this is not just anecdotes. There's lots of studies. If you took a man and a woman in their first career, the first job equally qualified, they both get hired. And the employer says, congratulations, you, you know, we're, your starting salary is 70,000. The man will say, I'd like 75. The woman will say, thank you. (laughs) So um, I read the book. I talked to this woman. And so I went to our chair and I said, just to be clear, um, I do love my job. And if we can tweak it in some way that I have some new challenges, I would love to stay, but I need more. I need to be able to do more than what I'm doing right now. And he said, great. And he went to the dean. And they talked and they created the outreach coordinator position for me because wow. I had, I had was doing a bit of that in my classes anyway, finding these, these opportunities. And, and they knew that I loved that and they did that for me. And, and so it was, it was just so affirming, first of all, that they did value me, which wasn't necessarily clear by my job title and my non-tenure track. It wasn't necessarily clear that they valued me. So that was, was wonderful. And it was a huge lesson. And if you're good at your job and you like your job, they're going to want you to stay and just open the door for them to be able to, to show you that and, and let them, you know, convince you to stay. Thank you for that. That was a phenomenal, (laughs) I don't want to say story, but testimony is what it is for me in in hearing that. Cause like you said, I didn't negotiate that was like, Whoa, okay. But that, but it was a bit of an ultimatum and they had to decide whether or not were, were your contributions worth keeping and they had to make that decision. But that goes back to, like you said, my original question, when do you decide to leave or not? And you didn't have decided to do that, but they found a way to f- fulfill you. And I think that's the missing piece there of, of understanding when does it leave? Is it no longer fulfilling? Is it no longer what you feel happy doing? You, you hit all these key points. And I think those are when you decide, I may need not just another career, maybe another setting to do what I love doing anyway, in some way. So thank you again for that. I think part of it is, so regarding the gender wage gap, I think a lot of companies now that have corporate social responsibility groups are kind of working towards decreasing or making that gap zero. Um, But however, there's still a lot of other disadvantages, right, that these underrepresented groups go through. And um, not negotiating or not self-advocating are those kind of more invisible ways where we can be behind, right? So knowing your value and having that conversation is really important. Um, In terms of self advocacy, I did an experiment. So um, my my background is engineer, I went to be a scientist, Um, I did some manufacturing ops, and then I went to sales, which was very different. But I kind of wanted to experience how does um, the commercial world work. And when I went into a sales role, I told myself, this time I'm going to reset, I'm going to try something different. Before I would just, in the R&D world, I would just put my head down and work. Right. I thought, okay, if I work hard enough, someone's going to see it and they'll reward me. Um, But that's not really how the world works. And so in sales, I knew a lot of these people are more um, interaction based. Right. And so I thought, okay, for me to be promoted, I need to have the buy in and advocacy of every manager in that sales group. And so that's what I did. I I spoke with sales managers um, maybe like once a month. I let them know like where I was going, what I was interested in, how how I was contributing to the greater part of the group. And I was promoted within like eight months. And so I was like, wow, this works. (laughs) And then um, I had a friend who was there for a while and hadn't been promoted. And she was like, what did you do? Tell me what you did. And I want to do that. And so I went with her and I said, okay, these are kind of the steps you need to do. You need to build these relationships. You need to nurture them. She did it and she was promoted. So I was like, wow, this really works. And so I was convinced that self-advocacy is like a, is a skill. You can, like anything else, learning math, learning you know, social skills, it's a, it's a skill. And so as you build it as a muscle, I think it, it, it actually really does help because we live in a world of humans, right? Everything is interactions. 
Great point. Thank you for that. That is, um, again, another amazing testimony about the, the value of knowing these different skill sets. I think it goes right back to what Laura was saying, because when she showed up into that dean's office, you know, you were advocating for yourself in every way. And this is what I'm about. And what can you do with it? So the same thing, again, with what Kat's talking about, just kind of showing up and, you know, you have this work that speaks for itself. But being present and people knowing your head's not down, they can remember everything you've done because they know your name now. They've seen you. They discuss things with you. So, yeah. And in the first five years of my career, I would just say yes to whatever they gave me in terms of salary. And then I started realizing, oh, wow, they expect you to negotiate. You should at least negotiate 5%, right? Because the male, the, your male counterpart is always going to be negotiating for that. And if you don't, the salary gap just gets wider and wider. And so what I learned to do over the years is when they ask you, how much do you want to be paid? You never give them a number. You say, for the role that I'm interested in, what is your range? And then you shoot for the upper part of the range, right? Or depending on your credentials, where you where you need to be. Because a lot of times women, women will either undervalue themselves or they won't negotiate at all. A great point. I, I know there's a lot of legislation pushing for jobs to now actually post their salary in certain states where it's like a requirement and some places don't. So I went on and looked at, again, some of these job posts. I found it interesting because they the ones that don't post say competitive salary. But what does that even mean? Competitive who? You know, so I was like, I, I'm all saying that's a red flag, folks. If it's, if, if it's so competitive, they wouldn't be as shy about posting it. And catch right about those ranges. Shoot for the upper half because these ranges are really wide these days. I'm like, what is type of range? Like, what would be? <laughs> I've seen a range of 75,000, 125,000. That's a big gap. So, and they'll say, and they said that it's a remote position, so it's based on geography. But I was like, even let's take geography away. Um, explain it's such a big range. So again, overshoot that range and go to the upper end because that's where you want to start your negotiations. Um, and they're expecting people to be humble enough to stay at the lower end of that range. And you should never do that because it doesn't give you a way to walk back if you have to, right? Yeah. <laughs> But it's good to do your homework and know, like, yeah. this is my value. That's what it translates to. I think being prepared with that information and saying, well, I was expecting X amount because I bring this, this, and this. Being able to articulate that is really important. And I didn't learn that until I was, like, in my 30s. And I was like, wow, people have been doing this for 10 years. <laughs> like, I'm behind. But, like, understanding that and having those financial conversations with other women is where I, I thought, any woman who is younger and I can I see that, you know, their salary maybe is under what is the average, I would love for them to lift themselves up, right? So being open and frank and having those financial conversations, because a lot of times, um, maybe in the household, in traditional household, the male may be the breadwinner, right? And the female sometimes or sometimes not does manage the money. So having that financial savvy and knowing what your value translates to is really important. So important. I wish some of our GE classes in undergrad were like adulting 101. You know, we, we all had to take like speech classes, but no one actually told, told us about taxes and job interviews and things like that. I'm like, they could have probably just made that one portion of, of that, you know, one extra GE class. We have so many of them anyway, but adulting 101 would have been helpful. And what do you do after you have this degree when you're out in the real world? <laughs> and, and how do you manage your life going forward from that? Because we a lot of us have missed, missed that portion. Of, of you know background like you said you figure it out when you're just like 10 years later and you know what happens with that is that you're like I could have been advocating all the while and then my salary could have been so much different so that's another trick too is that don't feel like because you made this much at your last job that you have to stay there I have a friend who always asks for um she goes up 30 percent in each job she applies to from what she was making at that point in time because she says the same thing I started behind so if I keep asking for that same range and I started behind and I'll, I will always be behind in what other my peers are making in that way. So when it, it comes to advocacy, I think that this is my favorite segment of our discussion today, just hearing everyone's answers and, and everything has been spot on. Um, I wrote down the questions because there were things that I didn't want to forget. So when it comes to advocacy, um, I agree with Kat, you have to know and be able to speak to the experience that you bring to the table. You have to be able to speak for and advocate for the way that you're gonna think about things, the way that you'll be able to handle things that's different from your peers or from your cohort, the other people that you work with. You need to be able to personalize your approach and be able to very clearly articulate exactly what you bring to the table. That's important when it comes to advocating for yourself. Now, 
as a black woman in a male dominated CEO hospital executive field and, and compliance area, when black women do that, there there's often a label that goes with it. Um, you know, and that label probably goes across race. Um, you know, pushy, um, too loud, too outspoken, too too vocal, too verbal. Uh, there could be other words or phrases that are also applied. I feel like I provided myself a great disservice earlier in my career because I was scared of those labels. My takeaway for anyone listening to that call is you're going to have those labels apply to you in a room, whether you're sitting there or even if you're not in the room. The discussion will be had. So you might as well advocate for yourself. You might as well push for what you want. Don't be afraid of the labels because these are the same things that your male counterparts are being congratulated for, for taking authority, taking a stance. They were so vocal. He was so strong and so passionate in, in what he was feeling or what he was doing. So don't shy away from the label of being too loud or too outspoken. Um, anytime I hear that, I automatically flip that in my mind and I'm like, that's a good woman to know. She's too loud. She's too outspoken. She's too vocal. That's a woman that's going places. That's somebody that I need to make sure that I'm around or at least I have the opportunity to have a discussion with. Um, and then the other thing I would say when it comes to advocating for yourself, when you're in meetings, I, I know a, a, I have personally felt like I've suffered from imposter syndrome. I don't know if anyone else has. Um, that's the perfect way to advocate for yourself. And I feel like this is something that Pat, uh, Kat kind of started with. Make sure that when you're in those meetings that you're speaking up, that you're sharing your opinions. Um, even if you're the only person in that room that has that opinion, it's still another opinion that needs to be considered. It's a different way of thinking. You've brought your approach and perspective that could be very different from someone else, but that doesn't make it invalid. Um, so speak up in meetings, speak up whenever you're in a room and you don't know other people, go out of your way to start building those relationships um, because people are going to talk about that. They're gonna talk about who they met and this person really had a different way of thinking. Um, so, so don't be afraid of that. Don't shy away from it um, and don't be afraid of the labels. Thank you for that. I love it. And what I was hearing between the three of you is definitely know what you want. <laughs> and then know your worth and be willing to speak up to let other people know your worth and what you contribute or what you bring to the table as that saying goes around in so many ways. Um, I think that's the biggest takeaway in where to start for self-advocacy in so many ways. Um, and, and, I, and I appreciate what you were saying too, Shirley, because I've been there and I realized later on that they're gonna call you that anyway. <laughs> like everything you're trying to figure out a nice way to say it or not to be too loud of, I, I won't say, somehow the label falls on you anyway. You're like, oh my gosh, if I'm getting the label when I did nothing, I might as well say something and earn this label. If you really wanna hear it, let's see, let's, let's see, here it goes. So in so many ways. Well, now that we're wrapping up and closing it to the end, I would love for each of you guys to leave one final thought that you can give to a young person, especially someone who is having a hard time recognizing their brilliance, as we say that, maybe feel like they're struggling academically or thinking that maybe they cannot achieve something that is set for it for themselves, some kind of a goal or whatever ways. What do you say to someone at that point, um, at that time, or, uh, just to remind them of their what they're capable of? I would just say that um, everyone who's ever, you know, set out to accomplish a goal always meets obstacles. There are always challenges along the way. There are always people who will say that, you know, that's really gonna be hard for you to accomplish. Do you, do you really think that's what you want to do? And you're going to have your own times of self-doubt. Um, but those things aren't unique to any of us. It's something that we all experience going along the way. And I think for me, um, when I was going through my academic career and earlier in my professional career, I would say, oh, this student or, or these people are so much smarter than me. They're so much brighter than I am. Um, but really what matters at the end of the day is how persistent you're going to be. If you continue to strive, if you continue to push yourself and don't give in or give up at the first sign of struggle or doubt, just continue to push forward. I do believe that you will meet your goal. 
I do believe that you will accomplish what it is that you've set out to accomplish. The people on this panel, I'm sure, and, and other people that the listeners may know um, have all gone through something personally. We've all felt like, I, I can't do it. I'm, I'm not gonna be able to make it, but we all did. And there are a million people smarter than all of us. So it, it's, it's not something that cannot be accomplished. Continue to press forward. I would remind everyone that you are enough. You need to remember that you really, I, I just wrapped up taking a, a class on meditation. <laughs> it was, you know, which, which actually I bring a lot now to, to life outside of, of that meditation that you really need to engage in self-love. You have to, whether you're succeeding or failing, love yourself enough to embrace it all. And that is going to carry you through the, it's going to help you celebrate the good times and carry you through the bad times. And always go back to that. I am enough. I'm good enough. And and whatever, wherever your path ends up, and it may be where you planned, it may not be. If you if you trust yourself, when you reach that fork in the road, or like Charnice was saying earlier, I thought I wanted to, I was pre-med and that just was not working out for me. I trusted myself enough to know that this change in track was going to be okay. And it ended up being better then okay. It ended up being, you know, the best into her own words, the best thing that she did. But if she hadn't trusted herself enough in that moment to do a brave thing, because it probably would have been easier to just stay the course and maybe not be as successful as you wanted to, but she's plenty smart. She would have passed. She would have graduated with that STEM degree. And, but that wouldn't have been you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have put her where she is today. So she trusted herself in that moment. And so I would encourage all of you again, to love yourself and trust yourself enough to know that when you reach those forks in the road and the, and the, the decision times that that voice will tell you what's right for you based on how well, you know, yourself and, and to, to listen when that happens. Thank you for that. Yeah. That's one thing Again, I think we pointed out that sometimes getting to your goals means you're going to see obstacles. And another thing is that you may readjust your own goals and you have the right to do that. (laughs) I love that. Um, I was just going to say believing in yourself and having that self-compassion as you, you know, progress is really, really important. Um, And if you're uncomfortable or you're experiencing failure, that means you're growing, right? And if you're failing or you're taking risks, that means you're growing and that that will be, you know, you'll, you'll be okay. And so, and the other thing to remember is you don't have to do it alone. You can always find support with, you know, your friends or your family or your mentors. Um, you don't have to go through all of it alone. And so I think that was the most important thing that I took away from my career is when I was just trying to do it, you know, and I was like, do I like this? Am I going in the right direction? When I found people to have that were going through the same experience, it really did help. Thank you all for that. I just start thinking about something when it comes to STEM, a lot of the innovations that we see, discoveries that we find or new technologies, it meant that somebody failed a couple of times to realize they were going in the wrong direction. So failure is definitely a part of the process. And it doesn't mean you end the process. It just means like you said, you're growing, you figure out something new, you go back and look at what happened, or is this something we still want to pursue? Or do I still want to pursue this? But failure is never the end in that way. So again, I would like to thank you all for joining us in this episode of My STEM Journey. We again, we have been talking to Dr. Sharnice Moore, Dr. Catherine Chen, and Dr. Laura Rivard. And I appreciate you all so much for coming in and taking this time to speak to our audience, to our young learners, and hopefully our future STEM professionals. Thank you, Sharice. And if any of the viewers want to reach out via LinkedIn, I'm happy to help talk to them, anything. Thank you all. That's a great offer. Thank you so much. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you.